a phone call from the United Nations in 1993 saying they'd like to come to San Francisco for the 50th anniversary of the U UN. The charter was written in San Francisco and it was signed in San Francisco. So they wanted to come to Grace Cathedral and they said, would you host it? And I said, I'd be glad to. And they said, our, our vision is to have a one-hour service where we'd have all the nations of the world there and we'll bring 185 ambassadors. And the other part of the service, we want to have all the nations of the world or all the religions of the world there. And so we'd like you to bring all the religions of the world. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not doing anything this afternoon. Maybe I'll just make a few phone calls. So I went home that night and, um, you know, what it's like when you say to yourself, what did I just say yes to? I don't know. I'm invincibly ignorant about interfaith. But as I lay there in bed on, uh, in February of 1993, thinking about the task ahead, I was thinking about um, there are probably 36 wars in the world going on tonight, and most of those are fueled, not caused, but fueled by religion, which could play a positive role, but usually uh, gets bought off and plays some negative role and is part of the conflict. And I was thinking about Hans Kuhn, who said, uh, there'll never be peace among nations without peace among religions. And then there'll never be peace among religions until, and then in my words, you, somebody creates a level playing field where we can meet each other. So I was deeply um, uh, convinced that uh, for the sake of the world and for the will of God, there's got to be a, a level playing field so people can meet each other, work together, and work through the dimensions of uh, uh, antagonisms that grow up naturally in the world where religion is uh, a key factor. So the next morning I just woke up and committed the rest of my life to being a um, catalyst for the creation of a united uh, religions. When we started out, our first three assumptions before we ever started writing the charter were Number one, this has got to be grassroots. Uh, number two, it can't be just people of religion. It's got to be people of indigenous traditions. And people who say, I'm spiritual but not religious. I'm into spirituality in the environment, spirituality in healing. Uh, we have to put them all, in, if you're going to open the door, just open the door. So, <clears throat> um, uh, and then the third thing we said uh, is that it's got to be women. Uh, when you go around the world like I did and you talk to the religious leaders of the world, you're talking to men. And there's never going to be peace among religions if men are talking to men around the table. Uh, there's got to be women at that table. So with, uh, with those three uh, basic thoughts, uh, indigenous women, I mean uh, uh, grassroots and women and uh, indigenous and spiritual, we got... Uh, we finally got the charter signed in the year 2000. And the genius of what we do in organizational design is to have little cooperation circles that self-organize around any local issue they want. And they self-govern, self-fund, uh, etc. But they got to live by the purpose and principles of URI. So, in the year 2000 we signed the charter and we had our first cooperation circle in our first country. Uh, Eleven years later, we, um, we have 570 cooperation circles, and we're in 78 countries of the world. We've got between 500,000 and 600,000 people, and uh, those people deal with about 2.5 million people every day. Uh, we've grown at least 18% every year since we got started, because uh, the world is ready for um, uh, grassroots, uh, interfaith, uh, cooperation. Uh, it's not going to be solved by a law. It's not going to be solved by some decree from a religious. It's going to be solved uh, uh, house by house, neighborhood by neighborhood, village by village, town by town, that learns to integrate uh, uh, Muslim and Christians and learn to live together. There's, there's no substitute for learning to live together. We can't set up enough jails, we can't have enough fights, uh, we can't have a Christian jihad. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, but uh, there's no easy out. The, the hard answer is learn like URI.
you got to learn to work and live in a small group of people with people of other uh, traditions and you got to work it out. Once you get a, a perspective of religion that's tribal, racial, cultural, it just narrows and narrows life. And at the same time, science and um, technology and everything else is expanding, expanding life. Well, where is religion in the midst of the subtraction into tribal and the expansion into a, a global, cosmic, universal sense of, and is God really a tribal God? Or is God bigger than any tradition? Uh, is God really a mystery that we're moving toward? Or have we got the mystery, have we cornered the market on the mystery, and then we've got to bring anybody in? Or, or are we all pilgrims? And so um, I think what's happening is that uh, the tribal people know that a big change is coming. And they hear the hoof beats. Uh, their ears to the ground, and therefore they're circling the wagons. And they're getting more tribal and more um, jihadish. Uh, uh, and at the same time, there's a whole big world out there that's waiting for a religion to have a new reformation. Uh, to come into a, uh, to join the world, uh, not in a, a ungodly way, but in a godly way. I mean, uh, where, where is God? If the Hubble spacecraft craft is seeing universes being created every day, uh, is there really a tribal God that we got to conquer all those, or or would do we need to relax a bit? and say maybe God is, uh, maybe we ought to open our eyes to the presence of God in the entire universe under the microscope and telescope and the whole works.